Hey folks, AshellThingsEnture.com. So today I'm just reviewing uh, fabricating a surgical, an implant surgical stent. Before we get started, here's some of the things that you're probably going to need: um, surveyor, some sort of stylus that uh, replicates uh, the two millimeter twist drill. If two millimeters is the diameter of the one of the starting drills, uh, here I've used not a twist drill, but something. I can't say out loud because Dr. Dre will, won't be very happy, but it comes with your surveyor. And if you remove the end, it approximates two millimeters. Because I just, I changed it. So, additionally, you'll need uh, the shuttle, perhaps your diagnostic wax up. And this is a, a great case because I'm going to talk about what I would have changed after I placed the implants. Uh, you'll need some triad gel. This is visual like here. You don't need it. Uh, you can use uh, auto polymerizing uh, MMA material. Triad's just a little bit easier. You need some Vaseline because this stuff sticks to the cast. I'm also going to show you uh, some uh, flowable tri gel. It's visual like here. Uh, any kind of acrylic lab burr, uh, some sort of six, eight round burr. We use that to make a couple divots in the cast where we want to the, the uh, say our two millimeter twist drill to sit while we form the material around it. Calipers are really handy, especially these digital ones. Bully gauge is cool, but I still don't know how to read it properly uh, when it gets down to those little lines and stuff. So um, these ones are really accurate and they can be, re they're easy to read. And probably the last thing, apart from some pencils, is a wax instrument. And we're going to use this just to block out any of the undercuts. When we fabricate this uh, stent, we're just going to replace all the material on there and it will flow into any undercuts and get stuck. So what I want, the reason why I'm using my uh, so let's take a look at my uh, the the same implant case that uh, I had placed uh, almost two years ago, and one of the things I noticed right away, and I used I based my implant stand at that time on my diagnostic wax up. The diagnostic wax up I was very uh, it had been approved by uh, our implant board the whole placement series sequence and there's my wax up and there is an occlusal shot here is it with the uh, opposing cast overall fairly happy with it however and so I based the implant placement and location placing it through the uh, sort of the central fossa of the mandibular uh, molar teeth and then straight into the cast you can see these little red divots of the first molar is exactly where I wanted it and the second one is actually a little blue divot. This is where I w we're going to place it today but the blue divot is actually where it, it ended up. You can see that on the uh, the master cast for the, with the implant analogs. So one of the problems what I ran into when I was restoring this is that although there is sufficient, we have two millimeters between the adjacent tooth and the body of the implant, my contact became very flat. I didn't have a lot of room to create a nice concave or convex uh, contact. So that's just one small detail. When we're going to make my stent today, we're going to move, have this implant place approximately a millimeter meet more, more mesial. We're splitting hairs here and it's just food for thought and I wanted to show you this case uh, beforehand. So when we start off you can start with your wax up, that's helpful, but you also need to take into consideration the anatomical structures. And uh, apart from your radiographic evaluation and your clinical evaluation. So just on the diagnostic cast up, cast making, uh, using it instead of using a comb beam to make a stereolithographic stent, we're going to use uh, these approximate values of, we want our implants approximately two millimeters away from adjacent tooth teeth. We want approximately three millimeters between adjacent implants and we want the implants to be seated uh, at the osseous crest approximately two to three millimeters uh, apical of the adjacent CEJ. So this is a, a, a neat case because it's two implants in a row and I, you can using this survey technique is really easy to do with uh, an individual tooth. With two teeth, we want two implants, we want to make sure that we have the correct angulation and distance. So what we do is we want to align it with the central fossa of the adjacent teeth. Remember, I'm using my wax up also. So I'm, the, the, the real message is you have to not only rely on your wax up, but the overall anatomic structures to 
fi decide on the final position of your implants. So I drew a line connecting the adjacent fa uh, central, central groove of the adjacent teeth. And then I use measurements using my caliper, which is really neat, and the sharpened points. So again, we went two millimeters away from the adjacent tooth. This is five millimeters of the implant body itself. Run that number down. And one way you can quickly visualize that, and it's important when you're fabricating your stents to know the size of the, to already have an idea what size you're gonna be using. Because that is the width of a wide platform implant for this uh, brand anyways, Noble Biocare. So it's important to know that because you, that will guide, the tr they'll drive the train on where you're going to be placing this implant uh, within the arch. So we have two millimeters here that I measured out. We have five, we have three between, and that gives us, uh, the lid has shown that that's a minimum amount to uh, have successful osseous integration and also for papilla uh, development. And then we have our five millimeter and then approximately three to four millimeters left over. So based on those measurements, that's where I went with placing my implant. Now, like I mentioned before, this from my wax up, the, the, the first molar was good, but the second one, now I re reflect, it was a little too distal, you can see by approximately one millimeter. So again, taking into consideration the big picture. So now we've got that established. What we wanna do is we, we mark off the axial inclination of the adjacent teeth. Uh, I mean, it's only a get, it's an, it's an estimate using our panoramic radiograph and or a cone beam. That will definitely help. Additionally, at this point, I just want to mention uh, vital structures. Stereolithographic stents are great because they can place the implant in a 3D position and you know where your vital structures are. Also, uh, uh, image guided, such as IGI out of Israel, um, allows you to visually see the vital structures as in real time. In any event, for our purposes today, we want to make sure that our implant is approximately two millimeters coronal to the inferior alveolar canal. And uh, watch out for any lingual concavities. That's a critical one. Here we have a huge lingual tori, and the patient was happy with that. But in some cases, the lingual concavity, mandibular myelohyde can, and lingual concavity can uh, cause a little bit of trouble. I've seen that before. So. We've got the kind of the basic idea. What we're going to do now is we're going to mount it on our um, surveyor. And we can adjust the shuttle to the inclination that we'd like. Remember, this is, a, this is mimicking a two millimeter twist drill. So we're going to, I'm going to keep it. So I'm going to now, okay got the axial inclination. Now what we're going to do is we're going to mark off on the occlusal, on the, on the top of the ridge exactly where I want that implant to be and then take a round burr and make a little divot. Just a little divot here and then for the second uh, implant and at that, what that will do, it will allow the 